I'm convinced that uh, a misunderstanding of the law and the gospel is at the root of most of the confusion about justice today. Historic reform theology viewed the relationship between the law and the gospel as a hermeneutical issue. Listen to what Theodore Beza, Calvin's successor in Geneva, said about the law and the gospel. He said, we divide this word into two principal parts or kinds. The one is called law, the other gospel. For all the rest can be gathered under one or the other of these two headings. Ignorance of this distinction between law and gospel is one of the principal sources of the abuses which corrupted and still corrupt Christianity. The great reform theologian, uh, Herman Bavink, who's, I think, probably the greatest reform theologian of the post-Reformation period, said this, But the word of God, both as law and gospel, is the revelation of the will of God, the promulgation of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. He continues, God uses his word to make his will known in the area of morality and spirituality, and it must be differentiated as law and gospel. Sadly today, many people seem to think that the distinction and the relationship between the law and the gospel is primarily a Lutheran distinction. Uh, That somehow that Lutherans alone uh, made this distinction and uh, drew attention to this relationship. But Louis Burkhoff, a Reformed theologian, correctly said this, the churches of the Reformation from the very beginning distinguished between the law and the gospel as the two parts of the word of God as a means of grace. This distinction was not understood to be identical with the relationship between the Old and the New Testament, but was regarded as a distinction that applies to both Testaments. If you'd like to do some reading on the law and the gospel, I highly commend to you a book by John Cahoon. His last name is spelled like Cole Cahoon, uh, but the title is A Treatise on the Law and the Gospel. The outline for this message this morning has four parts. First, we'll look at the law as a standard. Second, the law as a covenant. Third, the gospel as a promise. And fourth, the gospel as a covenant. So those are the four parts. Law is a standard. Law is a covenant. Gospel is a promise. Gospel as a covenant. So please get out your Bibles and turn with me to Romans 2.14. And we'll be looking at various passages in the book of Romans this morning for two reasons. First, if we want to understand the Bible as a whole, we have to understand the hermeneutical principle that later revelation clarifies earlier revelation or later revelation makes explicit what is only implied in earlier revelation. And so we come to the New Testament and we see the Bible's own inspired commentary on the old. A second reason we're looking at uh, the book of Romans is Romans is a highly systematic treatment of uh, biblical doctrine. Now, it's not a systematic theology. It doesn't include all the doctrines that we would need to pay attention to in a systematic theology. But Paul was laying out for the church of Rome, his understanding of the whole counsel of God in a very systematic way. And so we'll uh, be looking at Romans this morning. So please uh, join with me in reading Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and to 16. And here we're going to see the first point, uh, the law as a standard. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So notice that verse 14 says that the Gentiles do by nature what the law requires. Do you see the word nature? God created human beings in his image. And so from the very beginning, human beings naturally know what the law of God is. They know what it requires. What that means is you do not need the Bible to know what the law of God is. Uh, 
Now, our consciences after the fall are seared, and yet there is remaining light still within all men. You don't need to be a Jew and have the Ten Commandments etched on tables of stone in order to know what the law of God is. You don't need to be a Christian to know what the law of God is. Everyone naturally knows what God's law requires. Take a look at verse 15. It says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Now, this doesn't say that the law is written on their hearts. It says the work of the law is written on their hearts. And what's the work of the law? Well, the work of the law is to convict, to show you what is right and what is wrong, and to convict you when you have broken the law. But then a question comes up. What law is Paul talking about here? What law? Verses 21 to 23 tell us. It says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, and there's our term, the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. And so which laws are these? Which laws forbid stealing and adultery and idolatry? Well, those are the Ten Commandments. That's historically what, the, what theologians have called the natural law, the Ten Commandments. Or rather, the Ten Commandments is a summary of, of natural law. It's also called moral law because the Ten Commandments are a, a summary expression of God's own moral character. That when God made us in his image, he imprinted on us. The moral law of God is the very definition of love and justice. The moral law of God is the very definition of love and justice, and it finds its fullest expression in the character and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, someone might say, no, Paul is just using those laws, stealing, adultery, and idols, and he's listing those in verses 21 to 23 as an example of all the Old Testament law. You can't divide up Old Testament law. This is commonly taught today. In fact, I was taught that in seminary. The Old Testament law is one. It's indivisible. But Paul separates the law from circumcision in verse 26. Look at it. He says, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So Paul says it's possible to keep the law of nature while not obeying the Old Testament command to be circumcised. So what's going on here? Well, the the older theologians tried to distinguish between two kinds of law. There is natural law and positive law. Natural law is the law that is written on our hearts because we're made in God's image. Positive law are the laws that God has posited or just decreed in each given covenant. You know by nature what natural law is. No one has to tell you it's wrong to steal or it's wrong to murder, but Adam had to be told in the Garden of Eden not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He would not have known that had God not said, don't eat of this tree. Abraham would never have known not to be, or, or never have known to be circumcised unless God said you have to be circumcised. Those are positive laws. In the Old Covenant, positive laws included laws about the priesthood, the sacrificial system, and the government of Israel. And the New Covenant, positive laws includes commandments about church government, church discipline, and the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Christians wouldn't know to do these things if God didn't reveal them in the New Covenant. But the work of natural law or moral law is written on our consciences. Moral law does not change. Positive law changes uh, with the covenant. And so when Paul says in verse 26, the law, he's not thinking of positive laws. He's thinking of natural law or moral law that's summarized in the Ten Commandments. So what's the significance of this for the ongoing discussions about social justice? Well, it's just this, that the natural law of God is the universal standard of true justice, of biblical justice. When a judge judges justly, what does he do? He makes a ruling according to the law. In fact, it is inconceivable that there could be justice without a standard of justice. And what's the standard? The standard is 
God's law. Biblical justice conforms to God's moral law. Please look with me at Romans 4.15. Romans 4.15 says, For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is an essential verse to understand here. Where there is no law, there is no injustice. If you're not breaking the law of God, you're not committing a sin. You're not committing an injustice. This is a doctrine of Christian liberty. Where there is no violation of law, there is no sin, there is no injustice. If you don't break God's law, you're not doing anything wrong. Because the law of God is a standard of righteousness. Now, among many of those advocating for social justice, justice has nothing to do with God's transcendent moral law. Some are measuring justice in terms of equality of outcomes, which means we know there's an injustice because everyone doesn't have the same things. Justice means something like sameness, and they're claiming that they can prove that an injustice has taken place based on statistics. So we do statistical analysis, and if there's imbalances, statistically, there's some kind of an injustice. So statistically, there are more male CEOs than female CEOs. Therefore, there is male oppression of females. Men are oppressing women because of that imbalance. Statistically, more black people are are imprisoned than white people. And they claim that this proves that there is systemic injustice in the justice system. And while statistics might point to injustices of some kind, statistical differences are complex. There are many factors involved in statistics, and you can't prove that an injustice has taken place on the basis of statistics. You have to prove that injustice has taken place on the basis of God's law. Why did God judge the Gentile nations in the Old Testament? The Gentile nations, why did he judge them? It wasn't because of statistical imbalances. He judged them because they broke his law. They were violating his law, which was written on their hearts. Many are using critical theory as the standard of justice. Critical theory says that injustice is defined by imbalances of power. If one group has power over another group, critical theory says that's automatically and injustice. And the solution is to tear down the authority structures. But the law of God never teaches that an imbalance of power is necessarily unjust. Now certainly, if authorities break God's law and oppress people by sinning, then that's an injustice. That's a systemic injustice if that's happening. But the existence of a hierarchy of power imbalances is not an injustice. In fact, it's required for justice to take place. There have to be hierarchies. Intersectionality is another version of false justice. It says that the more minority statuses you have, the more others ought to believe what you feel and what you say. Non-minority groups need to check their privilege and sit down and listen. So, for example, if a woman says that she feels like men are acting in a misogynistic way toward her, then justice requires you to believe her because she's a woman. Believe the woman. If she's a black woman, she's to be believed even more. She has two minority statuses. And if she's a black homosexual woman, she's to be believed even more than that. And she doesn't need to prove anything. She just asserts it based on her own sense of what's happening. She doesn't have to define oppression in terms of God's law. She must be believed just because she's a minority, and the rest need to just listen. But Romans 15, 4.15 says that where there is no law, neither is there any transgression. People don't get to define what injustice is for themselves. They have to point to God's law to show it. And so all of these secular ideologies are actually sinful injustices masquerading as justice because none of them is consistent with God's good law, which is the very standard of true justice. If you want to know what true justice looks like, then you can look at Jesus. Christ was just. We look into his face and we see justice. 
Psalm 40, verse 8, is a messianic text about Jesus. And it says, I desire to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. That's Christ. The law of God is in Christ's heart. And think about how Jesus did justice on earth. There are many examples, but just think of a couple. He cleansed the temple. Do you remember the money changers and the religious leaders were breaking the eighth commandment? You shall not steal. They were defrauding people right there in the temple, oppressing people by breaking God's law. And Christ rebuked them for it. He turned over their tables. But if you read the text carefully, Jesus never broke the law of God himself. He never stole from them. He never injured them, murdered them. He stood up up against them and did justice. He also stood up against the Pharisees who nullified the word of God for the sake of their tradition. Do you remember the law of Corban? When the Pharisees taught that it was okay to break the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, as long as you were giving your money to the temple. You didn't have to provide for your parents. Well, this was an injustice to all Jewish parents, and Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for it. And so Christ used God's good law as the standard of justice and never secular philosophies. And so first we've seen God's law as a standard. The law as a standard is God's moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, revealed in our consciences by nature, and fully expounded in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So second, let's consider the law as a covenant. After God created Adam in his image and wrote the work of the law in Adam's heart, he made a covenant with Adam. Now, in historic Reformed theology, this covenant is called the covenant of works. Uh, This covenant has fallen into disfavor among scholars here recently. But I believe they're wrong. I believe that's wrong. Uh, One of the best contemporary biblical theological defenses of the covenant of works is the book that Fred Malone uh, advertised to you just a bit earlier uh, called Getting the Garden Right by Rich Barcellos. It has a wonderful section in there uh, giving a biblical theological exegetical defense uh, of the covenant of works. I highly commend it to you. Sam Renahan is coming out with a book shortly, within just a couple of months. Founders Press will be publishing that as well. I encourage you to get your hands on that. Uh, It will be dealing with the covenants of the Bible. But what is the covenant of works or the law as a covenant? Well, if the law as a standard is the naked law, the bare commandment, the law as a covenant is the commandment with a promise of life attached to it and a threat of condemnation attached to it. That's the covenant. It includes promises. It adds a promise. The law as a standard just says, do this. The law as a covenant says, do this and live. In a treatise on the law and the gospel, John Cahoon says, the law of creation or the Ten Commandments was in the form of a covenant of works given to the first Adam after he had been put into the Garden of Eden. It was given him first as the first parent and the federal representative of all his posterity by ordinary generation an express threatening of death and a gracious promise of life annexed to the law of creation made it to Adam, a covenant of works. Please look with me at Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, where Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so here Paul is wrapping up his argument that all men are sinners. And he uses this term under the law, which is something of a technical term in Pauline writing. It refers to those who are under the law as a way of being justified or as a way to avoid being condemned. Notice who's under the law. It is not just the Jews. This is important. It is not just the Jews of the Old Covenant. It's everyone in Adam. It says, Paul says, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. The whole world cannot be justified under the law. That's the covenant of works. Now, some people don't like this term, covenant of works, but the scripture speaks in a similar way in Romans 3, 27. If you'll look there with me. Paul says, then what becomes of our boasting? 
Is it excluded? By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. And so you see the contrast between works and faith or works and grace. You can see more of the covenant of works in Romans 10.5, where Paul articulates this, I think, fairly clearly. He says, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. So there's a righteousness based on the law. If you do them, you'll live. Now that's a, Paul is referring back to Leviticus 18.5. There's a great debate about what Leviticus 18.5 means. Uh, But here's what it says. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. And historic reform theology, I think they're right about this. But they, they say that this is the old covenant reminder of the original covenant of works. That if... Adam obeyed God's law perfectly, he would have eternal life. You think about this. There was a tree of eternal life in the Garden of Eden. Had Adam obeyed and eaten of that tree, he would have lived forever. But he didn't. He broke God's commandments, and he sinned, and he was cursed, and he died forever. That was the threat of condemnation. And this covenant of works is not only for Adam. Adam is a federal head. That's what we see in Romans chapter 5. And so everyone who is born in Adam which is all of his posterity since his fall, is cursed, with a, not only with, his, with a sinful nature, but also with his guilt. So what does this covenant of works have to do with the social justice movement? What's the significance of it? Well, I think it has everything to do with it. Proponents of critical theory teach that unless you work to destroy power structures, you are not righteous which is a form of legalism. If you're silent, you're condemned. If you sit on the sidelines, you're guilty. You must work to blow up the patriarchy to be righteous. You have to work to blow up whiteness to be righteous. You have to blow up heteronormativity in order to be righteous. And you're only righteous if you're working to overturn so-called power structures of society. It says, do this and live. This is a soft version of the covenant of works, where do this is not defined by God's law, but by a a substitute standard of secular philosophies. There's a a subtle form of working for justification in this covenant of works, and you can see it in the shrill tones on social media. People attack and demand that you do what they think is right, or else you're evil and condemned. Only if you support their agenda are you righteous. There's no patience, no graciousness, only law. Believe and do my way or you're condemned. Um, Many seem to, to think that they're earning their righteousness by shouting and making these extra biblical moral demands. And just think of it. It's a very easy thing to do, isn't it? To join that cause. It's a soft law. That's what all legalism is. It makes a law easier to keep and it substitutes God's true law with some other kind of law. It's easy to virtue signal by shouting against power structures and accusing anyone who disagrees with you with racism. But it's not so easy to obey God's true, God's true law. If you try to justify yourself on the basis of God's true law, you will fail. You can never do it. You will give up on trying to achieve your righteousness on the basis of God's law, if if that's what you're trying to do. You would utterly despair of accomplishing your justification. And that leads us, again, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus accomplished the terms of the covenant of works in our place. He obeyed God's good and holy law, both by meriting its life blessing and by paying its death penalty. And this is Christ's work in the covenant of redemption, which was planned in eternity in the eternal counsels of God, but executed in time in the incarnation of Christ and his life and death and resurrection. Please look with me at Romans 10, verses 2 to 4, where Paul says, he's speaking of the Jews, and he says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. 
for being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus ends the need for self-righteousness to try to earn your justification. He ends it. He satisfied the law. He gives you his righteousness for free on the basis of his perfect work. What that means is you don't have to treat those who disagree with you in a demeaning way. It means that you, that you can treat those who disagree with you with mercy and grace because your righteousness doesn't depend on you being right. It depends on Christ. You can love your enemies no matter what they do to you. And the Bible says love is patient and kind. Love is not rude. You don't have to prove your righteousness, beloved. You are righteous in Christ. He fulfilled the terms of the covenant of works for all of his people. And so there we see the law as a covenant. The third thing is the gospel is a promise. And so far we've seen the law as a standard, the law as a covenant, and now we're looking at the gospel as a promise. The gospel promise gives everything that's required for life and for salvation. When we talk about the law gospel contrast, we're talking about the contrast between the law as a covenant and the gospel as a promise. That's the contrast. Law as a covenant, gospel as a promise. In this contrast, the gospel as a promise of free grace says, life is yours. Life is yours. Don't do anything. Don't work. Don't try. Don't muster up the willpower. Don't strive. Don't move a muscle. Don't do justice. The pure gospel is this. Christ freely gives life. And you can see this gospel is a promise in a number of places in the Bible. But let's see it in Romans 4 verse 25. It says, Christ was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You did nothing to get Jesus to do that for you. He did it for free. He accomplished it freely. In Luke 2.11, our shepherds were told, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's a pure promise. There's no requirement of you whatsoever. In John 6.32, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. He gives you the true bread from heaven. In 1 John 2.25, and this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. It's a free and gracious promise. The gospel in its strict sense makes no demands at all. It does not require you to seek justice or to try to obey God's law. In fact, if, when people say that the gospel requires us to seek justice, they're demonstrating they don't understand the heart of the gospel. The pure gospel is an absolute promise. God is the one worker in the gospel. He promises everything he requires. He accomplished everything that he requires in the Lord Jesus. John Cahoon says the gospel in its strict and proper sense contains no precepts. This is the old reform theology. It commands nothing. It does not enjoin us even to believe and repent. But it declares to us what God in Christ as a God of grace has done. And what he promises still to do for us and in us and by us. Everything flows down from him. Christ accomplished all. He gives all. And all that you must do is what he first gives to you. That's the gospel as a pure promise. So how does this relate to the discussions of social justice? Well, I would suggest that it should humble us before each other. We all have the same inheritance, don't we? All true believers have the same inheritance in Christ, rich and poor, men and women, blacks and whites. Jesus earned it for us. We did nothing to obtain it. It's not ours because we're smarter or because we were born into it. It's ours in Jesus by free grace alone. And what that means is that among brothers... Amen. 
among brothers who are different in all these ways, there is no room for condescending pride. There's no room for self-righteousness. There's no room for any projection of superiority. Paul says this, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? If, if we believe this gospel of pure grace, our conversations will be tinctured by grace. They'll be filled with love and humility and patience, all the while never compromising the truth of the Bible. This gospel will lead us to forgive others as we've been forgiven, to love others as we've been loved, to serve others as we have been served in Jesus. And if you believe this gospel of free grace, it will change everything about you. Loving your enemies is not beating them up because of their immorality. I love you, so I'm going to correct you and beat you. As if you'll only love them if they first agree with you. Loving your enemies means being gracious and merciful toward them. It means keeping God's commandments toward them. It means speaking the truth in love, no matter what they do. You must preach the threats of the covenant of works. You must. But you must also preach the promise of the covenant of grace. So the third thing we see is the gospel as a promise. The fourth thing we need to see is the gospel as a covenant. So we've seen the law as a standard, the law as a covenant, the gospel as a promise, And now we're going to look at the gospel as a covenant. The law as a standard says, do this. The law as a covenant says, do this and live. The gospel as a promise says, life is yours. And now we'll see that the gospel as a covenant says, life is yours, now do this. When we speak of the gospel law continuum, we're referring to the gospel as a covenant in continuous relationship with the law as a standard. The gospel as a covenant begins with the pure promise of God and it includes all of God's commandments. The new covenant which God writes, in, in which God writes his good law on the hearts of his people says this in Hebrews 8.10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. That word write in Greek is the word carve. Calling to mind the the tables, the two tables of the law, the Ten Commandments that God carved on tablets of stone. In the new covenant, God requires his people to keep his moral law along with all the positive commandments of the new covenant. It's required. And that's part of the new covenant, the gospel of the new covenant. But the order is very important. First, you live. Then, you do this. First, God joins you to Christ in your effectual calling. He gives you Christ. He gives you every blessing in Christ. He gives you his righteousness. He gives you his life. But then under grace, not under law, but under grace, you must and you will respond by believing on Jesus repenting of your sins and keeping all of his commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Please look with me at Romans 7, where we can see that the the law of God is the standard of conduct for the believer in the new covenant. Now, I know that there's a debate about whether Romans 7 is speaking to a believer or an unbeliever or some mixture between the two. Uh, But I'm convinced with virtually all of the reformers that Romans 7 is speaking of Paul the believer. And I recommend John Owen's work on this passage. Uh, so let's look at how Paul the believer responds to the law of God. Romans, six, uh, Romans seven sixteen, Paul says, I agree with the law that it is good. I agree with the law that it is good. Romans seven twenty two, Paul says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. How could an unbeliever do that? In their inner being delight in the law of God. In Romans 7, 25, Paul says, I myself serve the law of God. Now that's a critical text. Paul, the believer serves the law of God with his mind. In Romans 8, 4, it says, 
that Christ redeemed us in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Notice that the righteous requirement of the law in this text is not fulfilled for us. It doesn't say that it might be fulfilled for us, but that it would be fulfilled in us as we walk in it by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Paul is saying that the law of God guides the believer to express our love for God who saved us from our sins. Now, under grace, the law cannot condemn you. The law cannot justify you. The law has no threats and it makes no promises of life to you. It's just a standard, a rule of conduct to show us how to express love to the one who bought us with his love. It teaches us what love is, which we need to be taught what love is in this culture that's so confused about what love is. The law of God tells us. The gospel of the new covenant involves God's moral law written on our hearts. And so what does this have to do with conversations about social justice? This new covenant of grace, this gospel as a covenant. Well, it means that Christians must seek justice according to God's law. And they must seek justice... From grace, according to God's law, both at the individual level and at the social level. At the individual level, Christians must live justly. That means we we must love each other by keeping God's good commandments. We must not murder each other by thinking, speaking, or acting as though we're superior or righteous. We must not lie about any creature who's made in the image of God saying that there's something less than they are. We must never steal from anyone by withholding anything for which they're qualified or by withholding any payment that they are owed. That's the eighth commandment. We must keep God's law toward others as a very expression of love to God and love to men. But justice at the individual level is not enough. We must also seek justice at the social level. Justice at the social level is achieved through the just administration of God's law through divinely appointed institutions. So the family, the church, and the government are responsible to administer justice. In families, parents should discipline their children in love, in grace, but according to the Ten Commandments. The same is true in churches. Churches should discipline for transgressions against God's moral law. In terms of the civil government, when there are violations of God's moral law, there should be penalty, penalties for violations of that law. The government should administer justice by preserving religious liberty according to the first table of God's law. The government should also penalize Outward violations of the second table of God's law. If you look at Romans 13, it speaks of the government, and then later on it gets into the law of God, and it lists the second table of God's law. Every human institution should follow the biblical rules of justice. And we should do it as Christians on the basis of grace. That We've been given life freely by Christ. We've been justified in him. And this gospel of grace is what strengthens us to seek justice in this unjust world. The gospel says that our righteousness is in Christ alone. And so in seeking justice, if we don't obtain justice, which we never will, this until heaven comes, but we're not defeated. And we can keep on going because our righteousness does not depend on our success. The gospel says that we'll rise to to live forever with Jesus Christ. And what that means is if though they slay us while we're seeking justice, we'll live forever with Jesus. The gospel gives us strength and power to continue to do and to seek justice in this world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great bringer of justice. One day he'll descend from the heavens and he will right every wrong. And he will personally punish every injustice, and he will vindicate the righteous. Psalm 72, verses 1 to 4 says, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills 
in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor, of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. In Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9 says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's go to him in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you that you are a good God. A righteous God. A God who is worthy of worship and praise. And that you give us your law as the standard of your justice. We pray that you'd conform our hearts and our minds to Christ, knowing his grace toward us, that we might be men and women who live justly in this fallen world. In Christ's name, amen.